All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Coyote Radio Show and Podcast. We got a badass guest today. Daniel Donato is with us from Cosmic Country. Uh, I was able to meet him a week or two ago at South by Southwest there in Austin, Texas. He was at the Colton House. Meanwhile, in music had a great showcase and was able to, you know, just talk to him for a second. The guy was so busy. Uh, I think he said he played like nine shows in three days, something crazy like that. So we were able to schedule this interview and I'm happy it, uh, it worked out. So uh, anyway, if you haven't seen Daniel live, definitely go. It's quite the experience and uh, yeah, wish him all the best. Before we talk to him though, I've got to give it up to our sponsors, Dukes Indy. Check out their website, dukesindy.com. It's the best honky tonk in the Midwest, in my opinion. Uh, Good people, good food, great live music. You can't beat it. So check out their website. And if you like bourbon and whiskey, check out Bar Distillery. Website's there below. Um, amazing stuff. And if you're traveling through Kentucky and Muhlenberg County, um, pit stop in there. They got a cool little tour you can take of the facility, and they'll treat you right. Tom and Kim, thank you for supporting this podcast. So, Yeah. What other announcements do I want to talk about? Uh, we got a huge festival coming up. That's probably something we should mention. Uh, early bird tickets are on sale right now, only till April 8th. You might want to grab those. We got a stacked lineup. It's two days of music in the woods. Um, and it's a mixture. Americana, honky-tonk, folk, punk, bluegrass, uh, you, you name it, stuff to make you dance, stuff to make you cry. You know, it's all it's all there. So it's it's going to be a great time. It's all included in the ticket price. So it's bring your own beer, bring a camping chair, sit down, bring your own cooler, hang out, watch the music, enjoy yourself. Parking, primitive camping, all of that is included in the ticket. And uh, we're not talking about 20,000 people where you can't experience the music. You can actually come and enjoy the day. Uh, we're talking, we're going to limit this. It's, it's under a thousand people for sure. Uh, well under a thousand. So, uh, yeah, ticket links in the description. If you want to grab a ticket to that, it's in, uh, Southern Indiana and Brown County, beautiful area. Uh, more details on that. Check the link below. It's called picking in the backwoods. And, uh, yeah, I think that covers everything. I think, uh, old blackjack here is ready to go talk to Daniel. So, uh, let's go see what he's got to say. All right, Daniel Donato, thanks for joining me on the show, man. Howdy. Um, yeah, I got to run into you very briefly in Austin, Texas, during uh, the madness of South by Southwest. <laughs> you guys were busy. Yeah, we were. We, I mean, we we're, we're kind of always doing something. We're always busy. Um, and South by was a, a real reflection of that. I think we did um, nine sets in three days. Oh, man. yeah you know and then and then the week before that we had done um uh a opening run with green sky bluegrass and we played the Ryman for two nights and then um we finished at south by at on um I, I think uh thursday night at like midnight and then um i had a 7 a.m flight out of newark or out of austin to fly to newark to go play with phil lesh in France for two nights in New York City or at, at in Port Chester, New York. Um, you know, so <laughs> yeah, and then we just got back from a, a three day run in the Midwest as of last night. So you know, we're just going, man. Yeah, well, I mean, the hard work's paying off. You guys seem to have quite the following, and uh, and you have like a, I'd say like one of those diehard followings too. Like they're following you like the Grateful Dead out there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it really, our community is really, they're a great reflection um, out of everything that we put into the music, they seem to put back into us um, with what they produce, you know, so us as musicians, we produce forms of songs and uh, improvisation and live experiences, and the fans are also producers, they produce energy, they produce attention, they produce community. 
um, and, you know, numer numerous variables of other things to be assigned to both sides of the stage, both the fans or the community and then us on stage. But they are, it really is like an equal uh, exchange. So it's like the more we put into it, the more they put into it. And I, I don't think it's a conscious thing. I think it's probably more unconscious than um, right. we would give it credit for. But it, it really is like the greatest gift, um, I think, outside of, you know, having a great family that I've ever been in a great band that I've ever been given in my life is, is our community. It's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. The, uh, yeah. I mean, that's you, you, if you feed into it, the band feeds off the energy of the crowd that especially in metal shows, you know, I don't know if you ever grew up in that scene, but <laughs> I didn't like metal and I still don't. Really? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just don't like it, man. There's like that in, um, like hip hop, like even hip hop from the nineties and stuff. Like, and I have no problem saying it. It's not that I don't respect it. Uh, I just don't ever listen to it. And when I do listen to it, I, I don't really get much from it. And I don't know if that's like, maybe one day I will, uh, but I really never have, you know, <laughs> and that was actually like when I was a young kid and like I first started playing and all my friends started playing, you know, that was like, kind of a splitting point on like a social level between my friends and I, because yeah, I think I was around, I've been playing for about a couple of years and then my friends been playing for a couple of years. And at that point they started going to like these heavy house shows at like, you know, uh, like fifth Avenue in, in Nashville, where it was like a skate park in, indoor skate park. And then there was also like a, uh, like heavy metal shows that would go on there. And I never liked it. And like, that's when I first started getting into like really, old time traditional country music so i when everybody started listening to like all the heavy metal and started playing all that stuff that's when i started getting into like ernest tubb and, and chet atkins and bob wills and waylon and and uh, marty robbins and all that so yeah. I, my path was kind of probably a little bit more individuated it, it was really actually strange for me to process like i really i really tried to like it but there's just something in me that really doesn't get it like when i listen <laughs> Like uh, Noah, who 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 um who, who used to play in our band and is one of my favorite drummers and um th that's ever lived. He's one of my favorite drummers. He's astounding. He has that thing about him where it's like you could hear him hit a snare and know it's him from one hit. Um, he loved Tool, and he would yeah. play Tool when we were still like in a Ford uh, Transit. He would play Tool. And I and everyone in the band loves it. And like I just don't get it. it just, <laughs> like musically, I can respect it, but like emotionally, it doesn't. It just doesn't send it home for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean. But I guess it is that way at heavy metal shows. Like the fans are just, you know, the, the, I mean, they'll get physically hurt, you know, to, to <laughs> stand there and watch it. It's cool. Yeah, it's a it's a wild time. The I know what you mean though. That's funny. Like the bands that or the people you mentioned, like Bob Wills, Ernest Tubb and stuff. I, I've got into that scene, started digging back through the archives, so to speak, probably late college. Okay. But high school it was grunge and metal, a little bit of hip hop and rap music, but it was I was definitely in the metal scene, punk scene into the college and then something hit, like I think it was Ralph Stanley that did it for me when I I saw him live. And then I was like oh my gosh, this is amazing. Now I have a banjo. Like, it was just a weird... Then from there, I went through bluegrass down the honky-tonk through all these forms of folk and traditional music. It just... It's amazing. It is. It really is. I, I it, it hit me from the first time I heard it. It was something I was like, well, that's for me. Yeah, so I can relate to you on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> if you could, Daniel... Um, Kind of start from the beginning. Where, how did you get into the music? Uh, were, were family musicians like what kind of got you into this whole scene? My dad played guitar, um, his whole life, and his dad played guitar. And um, my grandfather played out a little back in the day, and like growing up in that prime time of America, where it was like you play at high school dances and you know, Fender was like still a relatively new brand, you know, making instruments and all that and rock and roll was still a new thing. And, uh, and, and my, my dad never really, my dad never, I don't think my dad ever played on stage. He just kind of picked and learned 
the classic rock and roll stuff and Steve Ray Vaughan and David Gilmore and mm. Eric Clapton acoustic record was big for my dad and Led Zeppelin and the Led Zeppelin four CD box set was big for him. He loved Alice in Chains and all that. And um, Iron Maiden and the Ramones and um, my dad, the first thing when I was really young, we were living in New Jersey. I moved to Nash. I moved to Spring Hill, Tennessee when I was eight. But when I was like four or five, I remember my dad trying to teach me Mama Tried by Merle Haggard. And I didn't really like guitar. It was like a, it was like a tactile thing. It just wasn't for me at the time. But then we moved to Spring Hill, Tennessee on Christmas Eve, I think 2005. Um, and then uh, he gave me a, a small Squire Stratocaster and that sat in my room for a couple of years. And then one day I, I just wanted to start playing. And it was probably just a bunch of unconscious content piling up that had like kind of uh propagated me to eventually start hitting on it and try picking um it just took a couple of years took the time that it took which is how things always go you know and um when i got into it i was just kind of there already i just felt like i'd been doing it my whole life it was very very strange thing for me um <laughs> and i've just always done it i've always stuck with it ever since then it was kind of the thing like i've always been a very intense person and um like emotionally very intense like even as a young kid um you know if you ever get to be my parents and, and, and talk to them you know i i was always all in out of every out of anything i would ever do um and like really organized about it and intentional about it and something about guitar was just i met the source of w w that that could i met a source in a platform that i could apply my personality to that would be a great reflection uh for myself and i and i kind of knew that um right away and then i was just all in um and so that was around when i was 12 and then i started practicing all the time and i stopped hanging out with my friends as much and i was just you know devoted to guitar and music um and then when I was 14, uh, my dad had this idea that I, I go busk on the street one day uh, to try and make some money at playing guitar because he saw that I really loved doing it. And I I, I, um, I kind of had a proclivity for it, like on a, on a technical level, I was picking up things really well. And um, so we went and um, we drove about an hour north to get into Nashville. And um, I tried my hand busking on the street one day and I had this Taylor acoustic guitar i think it was like a 114 ce was the model or 314 one of those and um i didn't make any money i made no dollars that day and um as we were walking back to the parking garage uh we passed this club that's called legends corner and there was a band playing there and the band uh um was fronted by this artist named jason link and there was a trev there was a drummer named uh Trevor, who was known as Chef Coco, and there was a bass player named uh, uh, Woodstock 69, Randy Hall. And uh, guitar player Alex was playing that day. And um, Randy, the bass player, um, he saw me with my guitar on my back as we were passing by the doorway and on the microphone called me up to play on the stage because it was very synchronous timing. The, the, the In the three seconds that it took for me to walk past the door was the three seconds that the band just finished her last song to take a set break and pass the tip jug, which is what you do on lower Broadway in Nashville to make money. So like right. the union is forced, it kind of has a deal with the bar is that you can work these musicians to the bone, but you have to pay them like $75 for their four hours of time to show up. Um, but they can also make tips. And, and so the front man has to go and pass the tip jug and sell CDs and do that whole uh, Megillah, you know. Um, so Randy <laughs> called me up on stage to play with them uh, during their, their 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 set break, essentially. And um, man, that was it for me. That was the moment of like, uh, it was my first time ever playing on stage and I, I just knew that that's what I was uh, I, I think that's what I was called to do in this life was to play live music on stage. And I, I, I felt that very heavily. Um, you know, I don't really use the term revelation lightly. 
I use insight all the time because I think that's probably what happens more than not. But this felt revelatory to me because whenever I talk about it, I'm instantly transported back to the moment. I could smell it. I could see it. I, you know, and um, I remember it was the first time I played a Telecaster and, um, you know, we were playing in the key of B on one song. And I remember bending the 10th fret B string up, up to the uh, 12th fret. And there was a woman who was sitting there feet from me from the stage and her, her arms went up in the air, like a touchdown when I did that, <laughs> you know, and I, I just remember loving that. I, and um, I just remember loving the fact that I could play something that I felt and that somebody also felt, you know, so it's real, it's a real emotional moment that happens between two beings, you know, and, and that's a really sincere um, honest thing in life. And, um, I loved that. And I kind of was processing all of that in that moment. And it was, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And so at, at that point I was 14 and I instantly got into it and I, I was dead set on, this is what I'm supposed to do. And, and then the next day, uh, we went back downtown and I, I made $550 and I earned enough money to buy a Telecaster. And, um, that was also the day that I discovered the Don Kelly band at Robert's Western world. Um, which was uh, insane for me. That was kind of the keys to the kingdom, at least on earth that, that I was, that I was handed. I'm, I'm um, that band introduced to me um, the songbook of, of great honky tonk music, um, how to play honky tonk music in a way that's alive and um, how to make money as a musician, how to conduct a show in a way that's engaging and valuable for people. Um, all these things, um, how how a band leader operates, um, how somebody who, you know, how a great band operates around a band leader who has a vision, all these really essential experiential endowments that you, you really don't get taught or shown anywhere else unless you just kind of start doing it. Right. And so this is off to the races, you know, at 14, uh, <laughs> 15 years ago as of, um, you know, this year. So That's wild. You know, yeah, and then everything kind of just in a linear, uh, vertical way has just kind of led itself to this moment by just domino effects of pursuing that same, what seems to be an, it, it kind of a eternal uh, connection that I've had. You know, I at least to me, my connection to music seems very outside of space and time because it, it, it's something that when I do it, um, it feels like I'm tuning into something that already exists and I'm just trying to bring it into this domain and it's kind of always felt like that for me you know so yeah I mean that's I think that's it's kind of hard to say like where it all started you know <laughs> but that, that I think that's probably a good starting place right yeah exactly yeah. I love Roberts uh, I you know I when I go to Nashville I usually stay all off the strip for the most part but if i'm there I, i'm usually at roberts yeah you got i mean roberts is it you know and it wasn't always that way um broadway you know when i when i when i ended up working at roberts regularly i used to be able to go park my car in front of roberts for the gig you know and then you know <laughs> yeah you know, not now <laughs> no we'd smoke a joint and you know you can drink a beer outside of Roberts, leave on your car, drink a Budweiser, you know, eat a moon pie and go play a gig and, yeah, um, you know, do all those things. And uh, now it's a different deal. And um, Broadway, in, in my opinion, is kind of lame on, 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 in contrast to what it used to be, especially just at least on a musical level. Um, all the great cats and, and players that, that once graced that street um, who taught me how to play, music um a lot of them don't play down there anymore you know and if they do they pretty much just play at roberts or layla's uh yeah, layla's you know. yeah yeah but you know that's okay that's just kind of how it goes but back in the day i mean all these great country uh musicians that that no one would really know um but great cats like james mitchell and danny muhammad who, who played steel guitar with ray price and um Willie Cantu, who played drums with Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, and Eddie Lang, and he's and Hoot Hester, um, Chris Scruggs, um, uh, Josh yeah. Headley. Some of them still play down there, but a, a, a lot of them don't. Um, and a lot of them have passed too since then. Um, 
uh, you know, but all these, a lot of these musicians played with great country artists and, and, um, I, you know, it, and I would get to go sit in with them, you know, on their weekends and, 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 you know, ask them like, well, what was it, what was it like playing with George Jones, you know, during the no show Jones era? And like, what was it like, you know, playing drums with Buck, with Buck Owens that when you guys did live at Carnegie hall and like, how do you get that rim shot? Uh, snare sound so well and I would I'd be able to ask them you know point blank because I was playing songs with them and um that's kind of where I you know got to learn uh, uh, was just you know direct experience with yeah. all these great players Dude, yeah. that's that's worth playing the gig within itself you know not even if not even getting paid would have been cool to just do it yeah yeah man I mean there are so many great players down there Rod Riley you know, played with Jerry Reed and like, you know, all these, you know, just fantastic players. Um, oh man, it, it's wild to really think about. It was such a special time. And, and, and the more I reflect on it now, and when I do get to go downtown, I, I get to see that it was kind of a intelligent design of timing that was there. Cause I, I kind of got the last two raw, like the great era of Broadway and what Nashville on a traditional and communal level really is. Um, it's really not that way anymore. You know, a lot of the yeah. venues don't really care if bands are, you know, they come and go and players come and go and. Right. It's see. flooded. Yeah, it's flooded. Yeah. You know, back in the day, there was a lot of consistency with bands. So bands were tight and, you know, they, they would have these great set lists. You know, Chris Casello would be playing down at Roberts and he'd play all these great rockabilly songs. And you get to hear about the history of Sun Records and, you know, how to properly set a, a a delay to sound like a real tape delay slap back sound and like all these just great uh you know deals you know that that you know it's just not that way anymore um but that spirit of, of what was going on down there is directly what i think is on one of the organizational levels of what cosmic country is and and and, and, and um that spirit informs uh pretty much everything that that we do as a unit and a band within our live show um so there's like a direct history that um, the sound and this band is uh, 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 descendant from. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, that you can kind of trace back where, where it all comes from, which I love. Because what I find now is like in the era that we are now, it, it's very easy to not really have a history and not have a place where you're directly getting inspiration from, you know it's really easy to like not have because if you don't have a history it's really hard to form an identity i i found yeah. yeah i mean that makes total sense yeah with uh yeah I, your music kind of encompasses you know encompasses all that you know mixes it all together and and hearing you talk about it now versus me just being a listener or seeing you perform at a show um the way you talk about it and it really now it really just brings it all together for me in a whole new kind of light which is awesome oh yeah totally so how mm -hmm. many um i'm sure you've played with numerous people but how many like bands have you been a part of along the way oh man so many <laughs> um, i had you know <clears throat> I had years, I didn't go to college for music, you know, in a formal way of going to a university, but like on a functional level of what college is of, of, you know, a student who is desirous of experience and is seeking mentorship and gets mentorship from people who have, who have similar paths of experience. Um, I, I totally had a great learning time of my life and still do. Um, but yeah, I had, Let's see. I played on Broadway from when I was 14 to when I was around 19 years old, 20 years old. And I probably played close to six, probably close to 700 shows in that period of time. Um, I played 464 shows at Roberts alone with Don Kelly band. And then I had other gigs I was doing down there all the time. And those gigs were four hours a piece um, with three to four sets of music four nights a week and then there would be a lot of nights too where i would have doubles or triple shows you know where i'd play from 10 to 2 2 to 6 and 6 to 10 you know with other bands um so all those throw together bands i i you know who knows how many like that has to be at least 30 there and then um i recorded on people's records um as a session guitar player um 
Um, so I got to see the experience of that. And then I toured in people's bands uh, by being, you know, um, a hired musician who's, you know, intended to learn music that's already recorded and go play it live. Um, and I probably did that with like 15 different bands, something like that. And then um, I've had my own variations of uh, Cosmic Country of what I thought I would, what I was trying to make, you know, because when I first started touring in 2000. Uh, 18, I um, had already been trying to do Cosmic Country for about two years. Um, so there were versions of that band, and then there were versions of bands that preceded um, the Cosmic Country band as we know it today. So, so many, man. I mean, so many. I've just been doing this every week. Um, I mean, there was only, let's see march april may there was only three months of my life since i was 14 that i have been playing live music <laughs> at least that a couple of times a week yeah and, and 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 you know not playing live music not touring not recording on people's records not doing something um you know um so so many i i've just had you know and i i really have had i, I i've had a brilliant um opportunity to to not really skip any steps um you know i started busking on the street and I, I remember you know back in the day when there was a smoking side to broadway and there was a non-smoking side i remember um when sierra farrell came and bust on the street at the same time i was you know and and then you know i remember going to play a gig down at the stage and i remember going into roberts that day and seeing sturgill simpson wrap up a show at roberts um you know, and I remember going to load in for a gig at the five spot and it was like a band of like, it was a bill with like four bands and the headliner that night was Chris Stapleton, you know, and it was like, <laughs> so I really haven't, you know, I've, 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 I've had this great time to like not skip any steps and see a bunch of brothers and sisters in music, like see their ascension as well, you know, and, and, and um, you know. It's great. I feel like I have a very sovereign understanding of, of, of how music can be made and how the business can operate on some level. And um, because I've just experienced so many sides of it. I've toured with artists that, you know, you know, um, got signed to major record deals and, you know, got screwed over. I've seen, I've toured with artists that got signed to major label deals and became really shining stars of, of, of their life. And, um, I've gotten to play of people who had no interest in ever becoming famous and just become, you know, local musicians that have a nice quiet life and, and live a great existence and get better at your craft every day. And um, I've really gotten to see like every possible, a lot of the possible ways that music can create a life around what, what you want to do. And it's great. You know, it, yeah. it, it really is. And so when it came time for me to really put all my eggs in the basket for Cosmic Country, I, I had a lot of faith. And still do it in what I was doing and what my vision was because I I really was informed, and the older I get, to realize how I realize how different that is than most people my age, um, right? You know, socially, um, you know, because I've had really just a unique way of 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 getting into it, really. Um, but but still, my favorite thing, man, is to just, you know, I when we get on stage, my favorite thing is I, I just pretend we're playing at Roberts on some level, and you know we're just picking songs and there's really not a lot of stress going on. And, and, and the main goal is to just create an environment of music that people can dance to and have a good time. Yeah. yeah that's really it. It, it. it is that simple. Yeah. That, I, yeah. If, if you're able to step back and do that, I think that's amazing for artists because sometimes the, the pressure level, and maybe that's why you've been able to hit it as hard as you can and seem okay with it you know like you're in your element i mean everyone needs a break but like that's difficult your schedule yeah. is difficult like not a lot of people can handle what you just told me music wise in that long period of time and that stretch like it's not for everyone it, at that intensity no it's not and I, I i you know yeah i i mean i definitely have had my old testament uh, you know, uh, kind of bouts with God sometimes, you know, not so much recently, but like, why? <laughs> why every step, you know, it's like, you know, I, you know, it wasn't in the cards for you to put out a, a TikTok video that 
you know, one one year and the next year, you know, selling out arenas. You know, it just wasn't, that's just not what, you know, the intelligent design plan is for my life. Um, but the more that I do it, um, the more I realize that I really haven't skipped a single step. I've played um, every kind of venue. Um, you know, I used to get paid to play VFW halls. I, I would get paid uh, $30 and, you know, free dinner that was made at the hall, you know, and, um, you know, still had to pay for your own Red Bulls, you know, but that's where I was able to, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, that I, if, it, you know, if it, if it wasn't for that, I would never have been able to play with, you know, original members of the Texas Troubadours who played with Ernest Tubb, you know, and, um, and I, you know, I've played all the small, you know, uh, you know, shitty clubs that only have three stage monitors and, and they have, you know, three month old tequila limes, you know, that are still on top of them. And, <laughs> um, you know, so, yeah. so, so, so and, you know, I'm really grateful for it because I feel very sovereign. Like I've, I've, I've gone through every step of it. It's kind of the same story of like the guy who starts in the mail room that ends up having his own, you know, corner, corner office with stock options and, you know, on like a corporate level, it's that kind of a thing, but it's like, it's great. You know, I would, I, now that at 20, almost 29 years old, I wouldn't trade any of that for anything. Um, so I have no bitterness now, um, towards my experience and, 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 and how hard I've, I, I've, I, I've been, um, given the opportunity to work in my life. You know, Jason Isbell says the best, you know, I thank God for the work. Yeah. I, I really do with every, with every show I, you know, before and after. I, I really do. I consciously thank God for the experience and the opportunity to work this hard at music. Um, but yeah, you know, I think all of that was setting me up to one day become a band leader um, for a band that would have a really um, intense go at being a band. Because with Cosmic Country, uh, our fans, um, they, they come to, they'll come to whole tours that we do it's not just like you know we're gonna get a babysitter and watch them play for 60 minutes out of their 90 minutes set and then we're gonna be home by 10 it's like our bands our fans are coming to every show you know they're wanting to get certain songs we can't repeat a lot of songs you know so we'll, and we play two sets a night we play for three hours a night um you know it's like i did the whole tours for years where we would play the same set list every night for three months in a row, you know? So the whole experience of Cosmic Country is, is also kind of a reflection of everything that I've been doing up until this point. It's like very intense and like all in, you know? Yeah. Um, it's wild. I can't really make sense out of why, <laughs> why it is that way. Uh, but I, I, I'm so grateful for it, man. Um, you know, it's great. I think we've sold out over, I think we've done 48 shows this year and we've sold out over 35 of them. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm here in central Indiana. I think you're coming here in May then and in July. Yeah, we were just there, too. We were just in Indiana this weekend. Yeah? Yeah, we were in Hobart. Okay, up by Chicago. Yeah, yeah. We, we had our first time there, and there were 650 people that came and saw us, and it was the most – it was a sold-out show, and the venue hadn't sold that many tickets in five years, they said. Wow. Um, yeah, and we never been there before, you know. That's great. Yeah, and we played three hours. You know, it's like it's it's a strange thing to me. It, it is, it's, but it's, it, you know, I think the universe or God or whatever it is people want to call it, um, which is totally cool. Whatever you know, whatever it is we call it, um, it's a strange thing. You know, it is. Um, there's even like the parable of the strange man by the well. You know, which is that whole or the story of the strange man by the well. You know, I think beauty and truth is innately a strange thing um, right. on some level. So, so, you know, as I get older and I do this more and more, it all just seems very strange to me. You know, how each thing led to the next thing. And, you know, I was able to meet you at South by and I was able to meet other people. And um, we all have this great connection of what's going on. It's, you know, I'm just so grateful um, for how strange it is. <laughs> 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 really that's awesome yeah I, I mean just talking i love your outlook on this whole thing um but you know i've done over 
we're probably over 110 different artist interviews at this point, all different types, really. And um, at the end of the day, it's like, as an artist, no one owes you anything. And if you no. can just be humble in your craft, you know, and be fine with what the results may be, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not, and keep pushing, you, you, you'll be way better off. You'll be more happy, all that stuff. But when you start coming to gigs thinking people owe you something, you deserve this because you did this before, and that's when it gets messy. It's just not no. not good. Yes, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, I, I don't have any of that. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I came from a really, uh, a really uh, competitive, um, intense way of, of, of um, being a professional musician. You know, so... You know, when I was 14 and 15, 16, 17, starting to try to play gigs, I was having to, you know, outwork people that were, um, you know, trying to feed their families with playing music. So every level of professionalism and um, dedication that I was able to conjure, I, I, I more or less had to if I really wanted to work and, and learn. Um, so nobody owes me anything. I owe myself everything. Um, and, and, you know, it's all up to me on some level. Um, and... Um, and, you know, the the powers that be. And, you know, I give to that as much as I can. Uh, I look at it as like a 50-50. There's, there's you and there's whatever you want to call it. And you bring 50 and, and then it'll bring the other 50. And, um, you know, if you're doing everything you can, then the other 50% to some degree usually happens. Um, you know, and so, you know, at the end of the night, um, I'm thanking everybody at the venue for their help. I'm thanking our merch seller. I'm thanking our stage production. I'm, I'm thanking the bartenders, um, you know, because you know, it doesn't happen without everybody else. Um, and you're, you're playing music for a living. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons as to why it could be tiring and taxing and you have to be empathetic and empathize with those reasons and and, and address them and, 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 and be real with those things. But at the end of the day, you know, um, you know, like my, like my friends who, uh, do that I went to high school with that are doing landscaping and they're trying to feed their kids, you know, nobody's clapping for them when they're done trimming the hedges for some, for someone's lawn. Right. You know, people are clapping for us at the end of the night, you know? Um, so there's a lot of reasons to be grateful and, you know, even in even more transcending of, of, of the physical sensation of somebody clapping for you is that, you, you know, you're bringing, truth, beauty, and goodness into somebody's life through playing music and you're, you're creating an opportunity for them to have an experience with something that they can carry with them forever. You know, it, 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 there's really a lot of divine opportunities that are happening on the stage that, you know, you've been given the opportunity to do. <laughs> so it's like, to me, it's just, like, you know, I, you know, it's worth every, every mile, you know, right. it's hard brother. It's really, really hard. And you got to, you got to be honest with yourself and not let yourself get out of hand. You can't be drinking too much. You can't be doing too many drugs. You can't be an asshole to people. You know, you got to be truthful and be honest and you got to stay focused on, on what it is that you were put here to do. Um, and that's hard. And it's I, and at the end of the day, I think um, if I say anything that's worth its salt today is I think it's a living process that is uh, guided by the vehicle that is progress. I don't think it's an all of a sudden one day thing. It's just a forever constant progression and appreciation of value that just keeps happening. It's inch by inch, note by note. Yeah. I like that. What's, uh, so what's new as far as music goes? Are you working on another record? Yeah. I know you had, um, what is it? Three albums now? Three? Yeah. 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 I, I look at Reflector. Yeah, I like it. Reflector is kind of a start. It, it, to me, it seems like a first record because with my band now, it, it just feels like the other records are just leading up to those, like meeting those those guys and meeting those songs. Right. You know. Um, so yeah, we're we're working on new songs all the time. It's it's really hard with how much we tour to work on new material. We really have to create the time to do it and. Um, which which we do, uh, but yeah, we're working on a new record right now, and and um, but where 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 we're at on the hot on the lost highway of things is um, <laughs> we're just in our own lane, 
and we're doing what we do. You know, my vision for Cosmic Country is just to kind of exist as a vehicle of music, but in terms of industry, I want us to exist outside of the gravity of the music industry as much as possible. I, I want us to have no dependence on, I want us to have as little dependence on formalities as necessary. I, I don't want us to have to be viral in a social media sense or a radio sense or a streaming sense. I want us to just have great live shows where there's a large community present and we're all there to make something happen that has never happened and will never happen again in the way that it happens that night. That's yeah. exactly what I want. And, um, you know, I want us to uh, just do that, you know. And and the thing with that is you can kind of keep going uh, forever, you know, for, for a long time if, if, it, if it's happening at your shows, you know. Right. Uh, that's really the key. You know, I remember like when TikTok was first happening, and um there was like all these like um up, like i love zach bryan i think zach bryan's like one of the great um voices of our time right now like he knows how to speak to people that are around our age and younger um in a way that's very truthful but there was a lot of artists that were um you know getting big and then i would see them come play in town and they'd have like a million followers or something right and then there's like 30 people at their show and it wasn't happening at the show. Like the show just wasn't there. And yeah. it's like, and you're like, okay, so, you know, to me, I was like, well, I mean, if you can make it happen, like on a 60 second video, that's one thing. But if you can make it happen, you know, right. for or something, that's a different deal. And so that's kind of where my focus has always been is I'm just a live musician. And that's all I've ever wanted to be. It's just like a musician that when they get on stage, they just, they make, you know, something, something comes alive. You know, people always say, say to me, like, you're killing it <laughs> or you're taking over. And and I love that. <laughs> and I, get, I get where that thing, where that comes from. But I, I, I think consciously, if you look at that, that's a very um, territorial way to kind of, and very predatorial on some level. Like, I'm not trying to kill anything. I'm trying to bring something to life. I'm not trying to kill a single thing. Um, <laughs> You know, and I'm not trying to take over anything. I'm trying to create something. I'd rather create my own world than take over some other world. Right. Yeah. You know? And and um, you know, that's what all the great um heroes of time have always done. You know, even outside of uh, you know, I mean Jesus most notably. You know, but it's like um, you know, we are creators. That's what we are. We are creation. Uh, we're creatures. Even if you look at the word creature. It has the same prefix as creation. The same half of the word of creature is the same half of the word of creation. But that's what we do. We're creative beings. We're, we're, we're here to create things and to bring things to life that are born inside of us. And we're, we're supposed to externalize them in ways that are truthful, beautiful, and good. And they're supposed to bring enduring values of, of, of those three things I just mentioned into people's lives. And so that's all I want to do, man. And, and so to answer the question more linearly, it would be like, you know, I feel like what we're doing now is kind of what we're we're going to be doing for years to come, and I just want it to just to keep growing. I just want more zeros <laughs> at the end of the at the you know on the profit and loss sheet. Really, I just want it to keep growing. You know, so we can have lights, and we can have buses, and we can have catering, and we can have someone on the road with us to help us, you know, meditate or give us massages before the show because our backs hurt because we've been doing this every night. <laughs> you know. And like my <laughs> my neck hurts. I can only turn it left so far without being scared. You know, like things like that. You know, I want to have I want to have a budget so we could have you know a, a juicer in our green room so we don't have to eat hot dogs every day. You yeah, know? that kind of thing. Like, you know, I just want to grow and sophisticate the environment so we could just have more space for for the music to be created in a way so we can do what music can do on Earth. Because right. you know, music is a it, it, it's a, it's a divine thing, you know. It it, it truly is, and it's a language. Um, you know, when you when you listen to music, the wave organization in your brain organizes itself in the same way as if you're having a conversation with another human, right? So if you're by yourself and you're thinking, your brain on a wave level is organized electrically different. But if you're talking to somebody, it enters into a certain form. And, and when you listen to music, it, it enters into the same form that is of a conversation. But there's really not a lot of words that are being 
conversed, but yet there's a conversation happening. Yeah. So it seems to be, to be a, it, I would classify it as kind of a cosmic conversation that's going on. You know, yeah. there's some, yeah. something there. Yeah. That's cool to look at it like that. I haven't really broke it down that way. <laughs> yeah. During my podcast, I, I brought on, I forget who they were. It was two neuroscientists. One of them worked for Xbox and the other one worked for an organization up in Canada. And I think they were big. One of them was a big Grateful Dead fan. And the other one was a big uh, guitar fan. And I forget their names. And um, they were really great guys to talk to me. And I, I was really appreciative of their time. But we spoke about like what's happening when somebody listens to music and goes to see a show. Like what on just like a not on a spiritual level, but like on a biological level, what's going on? And it's a real thing. It, it, there's a real different state of life that you're entering into when you go to see a show. And so if the show's really great, um, and it's aimed at bringing something to life and being transcendent, and it's not very, you know, if it's not self-assertive too much, then it, it can be something that's really enduring for somebody. And so that's all I. That's really you know, I have no problem with that being the service of my life, you know, I quite yeah. the contrary. I feel really, I feel really ennobled by it and really lucky to do it. That's great, man. Well, I appreciate you sitting down sharing all this. And, uh, um, I like to tell people, you know, recently seeing you too, they're like, Oh, how, how was Daniel show in the cosmic country and all that? And I was like, well, it wasn't just like a show. I, I've just been telling everyone it's more of an experience that's kind of and what's the difference between those two things do you think huh what's the difference between those two things it's similar but with a show to me yep. it seems um very redundant um within it's got like these shaved edges it's like here's the content we're doing this night after night you know but for you it, like in corporate encompasses all of the extras the the set list is different might do something you know it's constantly changing so if you go one night that's why these guys are following you like you said you know night after night something's different it's a different feel and that's going to happen naturally depending on what venue you're in anyway but as far as what you guys are doing on stage and the music itself it's constantly changing and evolving and you know so it's just like this crazy experience <laughs> yeah it's awesome yeah. i always say with the guys and i think that's a great that's a great synopsis um i say with the guys you know let's make it a celebration not a presentation yeah you know because you know there's a whole different state of play that's happening when you're celebrating truth as opposed to presenting ideas and facts <laughs> You know, that's more or less what my dad does with his software job, you know, like, um, and not that, not that there's any, uh, difference in weight of importance between those two things, but I think with certain lines of work, you need to present facts and ideas like my friends who might be civil engineers and, and they need to make a presentation to propose a budget for a plan, you know, to install, uh, you know, renovations for a new building and they need new plumbing or something, right. You know, we need to present facts and ideas. You know, we need facts of how much it's going to cost and ideas of how much time it's going to take. But if you're celebrating truth, you, you, there's a whole different set of parameters that you need to embrace. You know, yeah. things are going to be different. Things are going to be changing because things are alive because you're yeah. alive, you know, and it's like, so you need to embrace what's different. You need to embrace the change. You need to embrace the idea that there are no mistakes and that it's you're 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 you you are without a net, you know, and, and, and the net won't you know, and if you fall, you won't break, you know. <laughs> and, and so it's a whole different, it's a whole different way about going about music. And I had years of playing with bands where there was a lot of fear of changing up the set list or expanding things and letting things breathe or opening things up, as Phil Lesh calls it, or um, you know, letting it ride, as Bill Kreutzmann calls it, you know, like all these words um of just embracing the truth in a in a present moment you know I, to me i think truth is it we don't really know what that is fully we don't know what love is fully but i, I think in the it, it i think what we can all agree on is that these things are alive because yeah. you you can because you are alive and important moments in your life you most notably organize them based off truthful experiences or experiences filled with love 
So these are living things that you carry with you. And these are spirits that are alive and they want to come into form through you. Um, so I would rather just celebrate truth and celebrate love and celebrate all these things. And I know that it sounds very Volkswagen of uh, <laughs> uh, the enemy, but it is. I think it is that kind of a thing, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, <laughs> hell yeah. Thanks for, you know, South by really to me wasn't the best platform for us to really do that because we had to play these short sets and we didn't have our crew with us. Uh, oh, yeah. Sure, you know, but there's a run and gun type of situation for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you know that Marty Robbins song, R Run and Gun? Yeah. That's that's one of my favorite Marty Robbins songs, man. I love that one. Yeah. Hell yeah. R cool. I love Marty. Oh, dude, how can't you? I know. Yeah. I just, somewhere in the midst of those records back there, I stumbled across this cool box set of, like, all his stuff in one catalog. Like, so... I just got yeah. it, so I can't wait to sit down and go through it. I think it was 1954, 57 when they did um, Gunfighter Ballads and Trail Songs. Yeah. Uh, but that that's was really... Like, kind of, yeah, man. That's like the apex of Marty, in my opinion. Like, And on the house music of Roberts, there's there's an old CD changer that's still there that plays in, during the band's turnover times. So if you play from 10 to 2, 2 to 6, 6 to 10, 10 to 2 a.m., um, you know, you have to have music going on in the house while the bands are setting up and getting their telecasters in tune and stuff, you know. And um, that record was playing all the time, you know. And, and so those songs are just, I mean, I, I've been listening to those songs for 15 years now and they, they just get better. They're just like the burned into you at this point. <laughs> oh man, the lyrics in them, you know. Um, you know, oh please, oh please tell her, won't you, mister, that she's still the only one. But a woman's love is wasted when she loves the running gun. It's like, oh my God, like, <laughs> you know, you know, these are truths that I can, I, I, you know, as a little teenager, I didn't realize that I would be living my life to see these truths become applicable in my own life, you know. All yeah. Time. As you get older, they sink in more, you know. <laughs> yeah, they kind of become you. It was like the truth that wrote that lyric is a truth that you also experienced in your life. You know, and so then that lyric kind of becomes part of the story of your life on some level. Yeah. Which is really heavy, you know, but although it came from somebody different than you, quote unquote, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah <laughs> I love that wow. record. That, yeah, that record is on my record player as we speak right now, ironically enough. I love it. That's awesome. Do you, uh, you have a website that people should uh, check out and keep up yeah. to date with everything? Yeah, uh, danieldonato.com, uh, cosmic.country. Also, as well, um, you can also just type in Cosmic Country or, or my name anywhere on um, Google or uh, DuckDuckGo. If you're a VPN guy, um, I don't know. You just type it in anywhere. Type in any of those things and I'll come up. Yeah. Great. Oh, man, thanks again. That, the, this has been great. I loved it. So uh, I'll try and get out and catch your show when you come through. I think the one in May, I might be at a festival. I'll have to double check, see how that plays out. But you're playing in Fort Wayne, then you're playing in Indianapolis. Those are my close dates. So, yes, we are. That's going to be fun. I love playing Indianapolis. I don't know if we've played Fort Wayne yet. Maybe we have, but I love it. The Midwest, man, there is a thing there. Yeah. Yeah. People love music, they love it. It's great. We, some of my favorite places to play are in that part of the country, man. So I'm looking forward to it. And, yeah, man, hit me up before you come, and we'll make sure that we can get you, um, we can get you a plus one to the show, and you come say howdy and all that. Yeah, man, appreciate it. So, yeah, thanks again. We'll see you soon. Good luck out Thank there. You. Thank you, Justin.